Okay, my last vlog refused to upload, so I'm going to have to re-record it next time. Hopefully, this one will upload. Now, previously I shared a story from one of Robert Fulgham's books. Um, I want to share another one. This one is from the book, It Was on Fire When I Lay Down on It. And one thing you have to know about Fulgham is that he's a Unitarian minister. Ordained, went through the whole process, seminary, the whole nine. So there's a couple different stories in different books of his about weddings he's attended or more likely performed for other people. And there's a couple in this book, which is actually from 1988, which I was five that year. And these are a couple of my favorites. So I'm going to read you one of them now. And in another vlog, I'll read you another one, because they're both ridiculously funny and say something, I think, very accurate about human nature. Okay, so again, this is Robert Fulgham, his story, his book. Not mine. Okay. I have married more than a thousand times, officiated as a minister at a whole lot of weddings, and usually managed to get so involved in each occasion it felt like I was the one getting married. Still, I always look forward to marrying again, because most weddings are such comedies. Not that they're intended as such, but since weddings are high-state occasions involving amateurs under pressure, everything never goes right. Weddings seem to be magnets for mishap and for whatever craziness lurks in family closets. In more ways than one, weddings bring out the ding-dong and everybody involved. I'll tell you the quintessential wedding tale, one of disaster. Surprisingly, it has a happy ending, though you may be in doubt, as I was, as the story unfolds. The central figure in this drama was the mother of the bride, hereafter referred to as the M.O. TV. Not the bride and groom or minister, mother, usually a polite, reasonable, intelligent, sane human being. Mother was mentally unhinged by the announcement of her daughter's betrothal. I don't mean she was unhappy, as often is the case. To the contrary, she was overcome with joy and just about succeeded in overcoming everybody else with her joy before the dust settled. Nobody knew it, but this lady had been waiting with a script for a production that would have met with Cecil B. DeMille's approval, a royal wedding fit for Princess Bride. And since it was her money, it was hard to say no. The father of the bride began to pray for elopement. His prayers were not to be answered. She had seven months to work, no detail, was left to chance or human error. Everything that could be engraved was engraved. There were teas, showers, and dinners. The bride and groom I met with only three times. The mother of the bride called me weekly and was in my office as often as the cleaning lady. The caterer called me to ask if this was really a wedding or an invasion he was involved in. Invasion, I told him. An 18-piece brass and wind ensemble was engaged. The church organ simply would not do. Too churchy. The bride's desires for home furnishings were registered in stores as far east as New York and as far south as Atlanta. Not only were the bridesmaids' outfits made to order, but the tuxedos for the groom and his men were bought. Not rented, mind you. Bought. If all that wasn't enough, the engagement ring was returned to the jeweler for a larger stone, quietly subsidized by the MOTB. When I say the lady came unhinged, I mean unhinged. Looking back, it seems now that the rehearsal and dinner on the evening before the great event were not unlike what took place in Napoleon's camp the night before Waterloo. Nothing had been left to chance. Nothing could prevent victory on the coming day. Nobody would ever forget this wedding. Just as nobody ever forgot Waterloo. For the same reason, as it turned out. The juggernaut of fate rolled down the road, and the final hour came. Guests in formal attire packed the church. Enough candles were lit to bring daylight back to the evening. 
In the choir loft, the orchestra gushed great music, and the mighty MOTB coasted down the aisle with the grandeur of an opera diva at a premiere performance. Never did the mother of the bride take her seat with more satisfaction. She had done it. She glowed, beamed, smiled, and sighed. The music softened, and nine, count them, nine, chiffon-draped bridesmaids lockstep down the long aisle, while the befrocked groom and his men marched stolidly into place. Finally, oh, so finally, the wedding march thundered from the orchestra. Here comes the bride, preceded by four enthusiastic mini-princesses chucking flower petals and two dwarfish ring-bearers, one for each ring. The congregation rose and turned in anticipation. Ah, the bride, dressed for hours, if not days, no adrenaline left in her body, left alone with her father in the reception hall of the church, while the march of the maidens went on and on. She'd walked along the tables laden with gourmet goodies, absent-mindedly sampling first the little pink and yellow and green mints. Then she picked through the silver bowls of mixed nuts and ate the pecans followed by a cheese ball or two, some black olives, a handful of glazed almonds, a little sausage with a frilly toothpick stuck in it, a couple of shrimps, blanketed in bacon, and a cracker, piled with liver pâté, to wash it down a glass of pink champagne. Her father gave it to her, to calm her nerves. What you noticed as the bride stood in the doorway was not her dress, but her face. White. For what was coming down the aisle was a living grenade with the pin pulled. The bride threw up, just as she walked by her mother. And by threw up, I don't mean a polite little ladylike erp into her handkerchief. She puked. There's just no nice word for it. I mean, she hosed the front of the chancel, hitting two bridesmaids, the groom, a ring bearer, and me. I'm quite sure of the details. We have it all on videotape. Three cameras worth. The MOTB had thought of everything. Having disgorged her hors d'oeuvre, champagne, and the last of her dignity, the bride went limp in her father's arms, while her groom sat on the floor where he'd been standing to stun to function, and the mother of the bride fainted, slumping over in ragdoll disarray. We had a fire drill then and there at the front of the church. Only the Marx brothers could have topped. Grimsmen rushed about heroically. Mini princess flower girls squalled. Bridesmaids sobbed. And people with weak stomachs headed for the exits. All the while unaware, the orchestra played on. The bride had not only come, she was gone to some other state of consciousness. The smell of fresh wretch drifted across the church and mixed with the smell of guttering candles. Napoleon and Waterloo came back to mind. Only two people were seen smiling. One was the mother of the groom. The other, the father of the bride. What did we do? Well, we went back to real life. Guests were invited to adjourn to the reception hall, though they didn't eat or drink as much as they might have in different circumstances. The bride was consoled, cleaned, fitted with a bridesmaid's dress, and hugged and kissed a lot by the revived groom. She'll always love him for that. When he said, for better or worse, he meant it. The cast was reassembled where we left off. Single flute played quiet air. Words spoken, deed done. Everybody cried, as people are supposed to do at weddings, mostly because the groom held the bride in his arms through the whole ceremony, and no groom ever kissed a bride more tenderly than he. If one can hope for a wedding that it be memorable, then theirs was a raging success. Nobody who was there will ever forget. They lived as happily ever after as anyone does, happier than most, in fact. Married about twelve years now, three lively children. But that's not the end of the story. The best part is still to come. Tenth anniversary of this disastrous affair, a party was held. Three TV sets mustered, feast laid, best friends invited. Remember, there were three video cameras at the scene of the accident. All three films were shown at once. The event was hilarious, especially with running commentary and stop-action stuff that's a little gross when seen frame at a time. 
The part that got cheers and toasts was when the camera focused on the grin on the face of the father of the bride as he contemplates his wife being revived. The reason I say this is the best part is not because of the party, but because of who organized it. Of course, the infamous MOTB. The mother of the bride is still at it, but she's a lot looser these days. She not only forgave her husband and everybody else for their part in the entire debacle, she forgave herself, and nobody laughed harder at the film than she did. There's a word for what that is. Grace. And that's why the same grinning man's been married to her for 40 years, and why her daughter loves her still. Now that's the end of the first story. In a different vlog, I'll read you the other story. Not today. But I think that's a great quintessential wedding tale. Um, granted, videotape is kind of dated since everything's DVD now, but it does, the point is that there was film of the whole thing, and not even just film, three cinematographers, videographers, whatever you want to call them, people with recording equipment, taped it from really all conceivable angles. And yes, the mother of the bride in the story has grace because she's the one who throws this party ten years later. Um, I'm fairly militant about organizing details. Granted, I don't necessarily let everyone in on all of those details all the time. But I don't plan on letting, well, mind you, I don't plan on letting anything go that bad. But as the story demonstrates, planning really has very, very little to do with what actually happens at a wedding. So, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, I have a pretty solid constitution. I do kind of worry about nerves getting the better of Sam, and I'm not saying he'll, like, run or anything. He, he's going to be there. We're going to get married. But he'll have a point that day, the day before, the day after, at some point where reality is going to set in, and he's going to feel it. Like, he's either going to be wiped, exhausted, or he's just going to Ralph. He really is. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible for it to happen to me, but... I handle stress better than 98% of the population, and that's based on proven experience, not just ego. So, um, I am trying to work out more. I'll update you more on that later. And I do still have a funny story to tell you from my trip up to Maine about what happened to me on the bus. Some of you might have already heard it, but I'll tell you anyway. So, hope you enjoyed that. And there'll be more from me later. And please, if you got a wedding invitation, RSVP. You know, there's a wedding website for a reason. It's not just for us to show you what's on the gift registry. It's so we know how many people we're feeding. Thank you. See you all next time.